More at home in the countryside than a pair of Wellington boots. More at ease outside the Ritz than an Armani dinner jacket. And more iconically royal than a corgi dog. The Range Rover has always had an aspirational appeal that belies its excessive price tag, notoriously poor reliability and build quality, and objective inferiority to its German competition. The car widely credited for inventing the luxury SUV in 1970 has only had four generations in 50 years, with the first generation vehicle being in production for nearly a quarter of a century. The birth of a new Range Rover isn't just the launch of a new car. By conventional automotive wisdom, it's the coronation of the new king of the SUVs, an early Christmas present for royals, pontiffs, prime ministers, nobility, ambassadors, plutocrats, celebrities and aspirants alike whose £70,000 purchase price doesn't just buy a car, but a badge denoting membership of an exclusive social club. The 2022 fifth generation is due to launch this evening, the launch having been expedited in view of leaked photos showing the car's design. The question is, is it any good? If previous models are anything to go by, it won't be reliable, it will be overpriced, and it will be less advanced than competitors. The key question is therefore aesthetics. Does it look the part? And leaked photos should be good enough for us to form a view. So without further ado, let's take a look. But before looking at the new model, it's worth reminding ourselves of the brand's history, history and pedigree and how we got to the present point. The origins of the Range Rover lie with the Rover Company. Older UK viewers will recall Rover cars, but overseas viewers might not have heard of the brand. Suffice to say, it was one of the largest UK car companies until its demise in the 2000s. It formed part of British Leyland, the massive car conglomerate nationalised by the British government in the 1970s, which owned many major UK car brands, including Jaguar, MG, Mini, Triumph, and of course Land Rover. The Rover company invented the iconic Land Rover in 1947 in the aftermath of World War II. Inspired by Willie's Jeep, its designer observed a Jeep on an Anglesey beach in Wales. The original purpose of the car was to help British farmers, but it quickly caught on as the vehicle of choice for militaries, police forces and explorers around the world. It was such a successful go-anywhere vehicle and such a staple in the final days of the British Empire and early days of the Commonwealth that it is said that the first car ever seen by half the world's population was a Land Rover. Over 7 million were sold. Tough and capable as the Land Rover Defender was, no one could accuse it of being luxurious or dynamic on the road. And so in the 1950s, the Rover Company experimented with the Road Rover before going on to build the first Range Rover prototype in 1967. Interestingly, and despite conventional wisdom, the Range Rover was not the world's first luxury 4x4. Indeed, the Jeep Wagoneer, a new version of which launched this year, was launched back in November of 1962, some eight years prior. Range is a reference to farm, which in turn refers to the gentleman farmers who were envisaged as likely customers. At launch, the Range Rover wasn't a particularly luxurious car. It came with vinyl seats and plastic dashboards designed to be washed down with a hose. In 1970, the car was launched as a two-door SUV. Bizarrely, you couldn't buy a five-door version from Land Rover until 1980 although a number of coach builders would undertake a conversion for you, with Pablo Escobar being a notorious customer of such a conversion. Equally, conversions were used for ambulances, for fire engines, for stretch limousines, for Saudi royals, and many other adaptations were made by specialist coach builders. The car was exhibited at the Louvre in Paris, as an exemplary work of industrial design and in 1972 became the first vehicle 
to traverse the Americas from north to south. In 1979, going on to win the first ever Paris-Dakar rally. Noting that the clientele was moving up market, the car gradually became less utilitarian and more luxurious in the 1980s. Leather trim and automatic transmissions, a staple of any luxury car, arrived as late as 1984, some 14 years after production commenced. Humble origins indeed for the king of the luxury SUV. 17 years after production commenced, in perhaps one of the most successful marketing coups in automotive history, Land Rover launched the vehicle into the US at the 1987 Los Angeles Auto Show as a luxury vehicle. They launched the car as a new model, despite the fact that it was 17 years old. Imagine doing that today. Prior to that, if you wanted a Range Rover in the US, you had to import one through the grey market or through Aston Martin's American division. In 1992, Land Rover provided a stretched long wheelbase version and air suspension, laying the foundations of the modern luxury car we know today. All other Land Rover models flowed from the Range Rover, the original Discovery being built on a Range Rover chassis. But Range Rover didn't just lay the foundations for Land Rover's success, but also BMW SUVs and their many, many competitors that have since followed. In 1994, BMW purchased the Rover Group and in 2000 split it into separate companies, including Land Rover. It's widely believed that one of the main motivations for acquiring Rover was to in turn acquire Land Rover's off-road technology thus providing the foundation for the original BMW X5 and all BMW SUVs that followed. The split tailgate, four-wheel drive system and hill descent control on the original X5 all beckon from the original Range Rover. In 1994, Land Rover launched the second generation Range Rover, which moved the brand considerably more upmarket, featuring a more premium interior with soft Connolly leather wood trim and satellite navigation as options. For the first time, it was possible to purchase the Range Rover with a BMW diesel engine alongside the older Rover-derived V8. The first all-new Range Rover designed under BMW ownership, with many of its components and systems deriving from the 7 Series, and possibly the vehicle that helped cement the Range Rover as king of the luxury SUVs, was the third-generation 2001 model. BMW sold Jaguar Land Rover to Ford for $3 billion in 2000 before the third generation launched, and thus although BMW developed the car, it was Ford that reaped the benefits. The car was an instant hit. Its bold styling was cutting edge and revolutionary, but remained instantly recognisable as a Range Rover. Its interior was one of the best in the industry. BMW made the bold decision to transition from the off-road orthodoxy of a ladder frame chassis to a modern monocoque unibody which preserved off-road ability whilst greatly improving on-road performance. It was undoubtedly the king of luxury SUVs with sales to match, although reliability was not good and the car, whilst luxurious, was somewhat lethargic when equipped with the early diesel engines, the air suspension being tuned for comfort rather than handling, with the car feeling somewhat cumbersome in the corners. It was certainly no X5. The car received updates in 2005, 2006, 2007, 2010 and 2011, transitioning from BMW engines to those derived from Jaguar and Ford, with a number of special additions and modifications to both design and technology. Ford sold Jaguar Land Rover to India's Tata Motors in 2008. The fourth and current generation Range Rover came out in 2012. It continued the revolutionary approach of the previous generation by once again pushing the boundaries of technology and design rather than playing it safe and mimicking the design of the previous generation. It was a much more rounded design than the bluff, angular aesthetic of its predecessor, 
it looked modern and fresh-faced, and used an all-aluminium monocoque unitary body structure, resulting in a weight reduction of nearly half a metric tonne. This made the car more agile, more economical and faster, and meant that later versions could be powered by a 2-litre four-cylinder hybrid engine, something unthinkable in its more pre portly predecessor. The interior was also modern and fresh, with an elegant minimalist design. It was widely touted as the best interior in the industry at launch, with commentators saying that it compared to Bentley and Rolls-Royce in terms of levels of comfort, design and refinement. The exterior design, particularly the grille, headlight graphics and tapered profile, provide the basis for a number of lucrative spin-off Range Rover models, including the Evoque, the Sport and the Velar, which made Range Rover, Range Rover ownership more accessible, allowing Land Rover to raise the prices of the flagship full-size Range Rover. However, when you offer Range Rovers in small, medium and large, it does somewhat dilute the brand and does begin to make the trademark face of the Range Rover somewhat less exclusive. Equally, the competition has significantly increased over the lifetime of this model. During the third generation, there was plenty of choice if you wanted a sport SUV, but if you wanted the last word in luxury, it was Range Rover or Range Rover, whether you were a wealthy professional or the Sultan of Brunei. But that's not the case anymore. There's the BMW X7, the Mercedes GLS, the Audi Q7. You might say, yes, but they don't quite have the pedigree or cachet of the Range Rover, and I'd be inclined to agree. But whilst Prince William might have driven his newborn baby home in a Range Rover several years ago, he was spotted last week driving his family on holiday in an Audi Q7. If you want to talk pedigree, what about the Rolls-Royce Cullinan and the Bentley Bentayga? Okay, they're ostentatious, slightly grotesque in design, and may not be as good off-road. But what's the point of being king of SUVs when you're eclipsed by an SUV from the king of the motor car? Land Rover have tried stretching the vehicle and adding new trims with avaricious price tags to match, but they're not fooling anybody. It's no longer the most luxurious SUV. It's no longer good enough for them to rest on their laurels. Equally, in the most recent James Bond films, you don't see a Range Rover as you would have done in older films. It's the Range Rover Sport or the Land Rover Defender. Why? Because the old model is old news. And attractive though the design is, over the past decade, we've seen it before. And frankly, other Land Rover models are more exciting. Ten years later, it's time for something new. It's time for the Range Rover to evolve once again. This isn't 1970, with an uncrowded market, happy to accept the same recipe reheated over a 25-year time span. And with Land Rover's brutal culling, of the Jaguar XJ Saloon, a vehicle with an even longer lineage than the Range Rover. This car doesn't just need to be the king of SUVs, it needs to be the king of luxury. And the only way to do that is to be bold and radical. And, well, frankly they just haven't. They've tried to play it safe with an evolutionary design. The front is basically the same, only less attractive. The headlight graphics and grille shape look identical to the Range Rover Sport, virtually, and for some reason Land Rover has decided to go for smaller lights and grilles. The very element that gives a car its face, its personality. Instead they've opted for ever taller front bumpers. It's the automotive equivalent of a man wearing his trousers above his waist, and it makes the front look bulky and monotonous, a bit like the Discovery. They had the chance to give the Range Rover a new face in a way that both predecessors did, but they decided instead to essentially retain the major design cues that had been there for 10 years, not only on the Range Rover, but on the other derivative models. It was a time for change. The side profile looks virtually unchanged too, except for the rear, which we'll come on to, which is somewhat incongruous alongside the curvature of the rest of the vehicle. The previous hockey stick highlight, which ran from the A-pillar to the rear doors, is gone and replaced with a silver U-shape. Why a U? And then we come to the rear. What is it with Land Rover and rear ends? The Discovery looks lopsided 
the Defender bears more than a passing resemblance to a Vitara from the 1990s. On the new Range Rover, in my view, they've abandoned one of the Range Rover trademark design elements, the rear taillight cluster. The side strips are somewhat subsumed within the dominant black strip across the width of the tailgate, which itself is somewhat subsumed by the blacked-out window and surround graphics that Land Rover used to convey a floating roof. The result is that the eye is drawn to the large expanse of flat metal around the number plate, with the tail lights being lost. It's a similar minimalist design to the front, which also seems to subordinate headlight graphics to an expansive and monotonous front bumper. I don't find the rear elegant or modern. Competitors are using really interesting lighting graphics and are making tailgates look remarkably shapely whilst preserving rear boot space. This just looks boxy and dull in my view and doesn't fit with the rest of the car. Maybe it'll grow on us or look better in the metal, but on first glance, I'm not convinced. It's also disappointing to see that the iconic split tailgate has been slightly diluted by making the upper section much larger than the lower section. Given the unpunctuated expanse of metal on the upper tailgate, I don't think that was necessary. The interior is slightly underwhelming also, particularly when you compare it to something like the new S-Class. Luxurious, yes. Unique, no. Once again, evolutionary rather than revolutionary. The screens seem less prominent than on the existing car, which has dual screens in the centre console. The floating centre screen is okay, but nothing new. And if they were going for minimalism, I think Audi does it better. If they were going for a prominent screen, then Mercedes and Tesla clearly are more prominent. There's nothing in the interior design that particularly distinguishes it from a vehicle that you might have had over the last few years. You couldn't say that of the previous model, nor could you say it of the model before that. It's disappointing that Range Rover has not once again moved the game forward. I'm sure we all look forward to seeing the launch tonight and seeing the vehicle in the metal. Let me know what you think about the car in the comments below.